I was so much older then. I'm dedicating this piece tonight to uh, Ira, Ivan, Ted, Amiri, Sylvia, and Thule. We are the post-beat poets. We are the TV generation. We are the true light of dope, sex, and profanity. We are the afterthoughts of post-war experimentation. We are the results of a nation in turmoil and change. We are the ultimate over 30 crowd, spoiled, seasoned, and prejudiced. We are the atom bomb anathemas and the LSD corruptors. We made pot a household word and caused our parents to rebel. We have tried to make clear all the knowledge that has been put down before us. We are the post-beat poets inspired by tigers, queers, wife killers, yaji eaters, bookshop owners, freedom fighters, junkies, priests, and jazz. We try the coast on advice of holy word and read the holies and scripture on lonely beaches with wine and music in lonely forests, awake on pills and settled back slowly into city lights where warm hearts have always seemed to once again return. Some of us have families and work hard while some take it easy the hard way. Some of us lived in the open like Jack and now spend hours in front of the tube, angry and anti our former liberal selves. But we all still write our words, their words, all words, for ourself and everyone. We get crazy drunk like Corso, yet sweeter flowers never grew, and holier than thou like Ginsburg. We get satirically surreal like burrows, adding up time like so many starship stereo ghosts. We shot it too and watched it too, drawing those demons in front of the Chelsea Hotel. We've become chroniclers of each other's lives, sifting through styles and stealing moonbeams as we sit with Mother Earth between our toes, swooning like Snyder. We go off to the monasteries to worship the fat man and write the haiku. We never forget our friends. Occasionally one of us disappears into the karmic mists of forever, never to return. And others just remain silent and musical, growing more profound every year. We are the post-beat poets, becoming more certain and proud of our immediate heritage while discovering the cool night eyes of the honey-colored cat lying lazy on the carpet near the color TV. Hip and classless, very primitive 20th century, very well informed, we all have our specialties, our meanings, our personal styles, our beliefs always changing, yet always the same. We all have our time, and our time is now. The girl in the red dress is me. This dress, this dress is so short. From Paraphernalia, New York. You can check out the label. <laughs> We're in Madrid, the poet in me, Madrid, so hot. So terrific shrimp and tapas, lots of people traffic, tons in the street. It's noon like that, and we're up on the concrete, and this truck, the truck driver calling out to my skirt, my red dress, my legs, me, the truck goes right up on the sidewalk and hits the wall. Alan is coming. Alan is coming. <gasps> my boyfriend, the poet, is doing the Paris Review interview with Alan Friday evening, Whitson weekend, and pouring foul, foul weather. <laughs> This is supposed to be the one fine weekend in English weather. Instead, blinding rain. They come back later, drenched. Alan pissed because I don't have double clotted cream to go with strawberries. 
I explain it's a holiday and none has delivered and had I known Elaine Feinstein and husband and small baby arrive in pouring rain. I guess they have a car. They all, the poets and the baby, go in the other room to discuss poetry. I, the girlfriend, remain in the kitchen. You have to remember, this is the 60s. <laughs> Next morning dawns brilliant and sunny. We take Alan downstairs and kind of point him in the direction of the Bodleian to check out the Blake etchings where he'll spend the whole day. As soon as we step out the door, we see, leaning against the cars, many young men. I've never quite seen their like before. I know, I think, they're Malaysian or from the Indian subcontinent. They are men of color and they have on little dark suits and their hair is slicked back and clearly they are here for Alan. As we walk down the street, students suddenly hang out the windows and they're shouting, Alan, Alan. And I see that here in England, Alan is a phenomenon. What is now called a <coughs> cultural hero? Saturday night. Alan is giving a reading at King's, the library, I guess the common room. King's is the most gorgeous of all the colleges. It was built by the Tudors and the scale of it is huge but there's rugs on the floor, there's bookcases, the lights are dim from lamps, and we've invited a, our African friends. They've just finished doing the first performances of Wally Sayinka's one act. And mostly everybody sits on the floor, and Alan doesn't so much read as perform. He stands, he wears his symbols, he chants, and he gives forth this kind of marvel, of course, of energy and relaxed joy. Everyone applauds Alan to show unity and appreciation, kisses one of our friends, Alex, on the mouth. Alex is from Nigeria, attending Cambridge, and is one of the <coughs> runners in the All-British Great Games. We had watched him rounding the course on a little black and white TV from one of the British West Indies Islands, right now he has his hands around Alan's throat and is choking him to death. You don't kiss a proud man on the mouth in front of his peers and others. All the friends jump in, a huge struggle, lots of screaming, yelling, and of course Alan, Alex is pulled off by many guys, and then the fight is over. Everyone spills out into the street, laughing, chatting. The next part is personal, and I have no time to read it, but su suffice to say, for the only time, the first and only time, I stay out all night. When I come back, my boyfriend is in my boyfriend's bed, and Alan is in my bed, coughing. And uh, <laughs> he says, well, we know what you were doing. I said, no, 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 I was just dancing the high life all night long. <laughs> This is kind of Monday. Alan leaves in the morning, and evening finds us all in King's College Chapel. There's a small but sizable audience. It must be about seven or eight. And sunlight filters in through the stained glass windows. We are all sitting in neat rows on folding chairs. And, uh, Behind an enormous polished wood desk, probably Henry VIII's, is an elegant gentleman in perfectly cut, pearl gray Italian suit. He opens a book and begins to read his poems. Thank you. Wait, no, I'm gonna read the last sentence. He turns the pages slowly, deliberately. He rarely looks up. Hablo espanol, pero perfectamente no. So though I understand some, I don't get it all, and anyone, hardly anyone speaks any Spanish, but it doesn't matter. We see bathe in the swell and flow, the soft flow and swell of his words. We are very quiet, hushed, lulled under an enchanted cape. Afterwards, courtly as ever, the reader shakes our hands. Se llama Pablo, his name is Pablo, Pablo Nehru. Thank you. 
Thank you. Richard West is coming up next. Let's give him a hand. Richard West. Well, today we had a hostile take takeover, as they say in the business world. And all I have to say is to repeat Santaniano, who once said that those who don't study history are condemned to repeat it. But those who do study history are condemned to watch other people repeat it. In the 60s, I was living on the, well, in the early 60s, I was living on the East Coast. I was with the folk, uh, the folk uh, generation at that time. And then later on, I, I went straight to the hate in the uh, middle of the 60s. And um, I lived on the West Coast, along the West Coast Highway, where it was flower power and sunrise meditations. Now it's tequila sunrises and power lunches. In the 60s, we tried to expand and transcend the mind. Today, people try to keep from losing it, their mind, that is, because they're trying to expand their income, and they're losing that, too. In the 60s, we went to Woodstock. Now, it's a good stock tip. We believed in the future. Now, it's the next quarter. In the 60s, man, people experiment with the truth. They joined in counter groups and such within the counterculture. Some even tried to reach enlightenment, or Satori, or Samadhi. So what's the money now? People just sit at the sushi counter eating yakitori. In the 60s, we had many visions of utopia. Today, people just dream of winning the lottery. In the 60s, some went to see the guru or the great man. Today, we just go to the gym. In the 60s, we marched for civil rights, war on poverty, peace in Vietnam. We had strong unions, a new left, an old left, now nothing much is left as we march to our underpaid jobs and overpriced apartments. We did mind drugs to explore the realms of the unconscious. We got spaced out with acid. Now it's antacid as we struggle for our own space. <laughs> yes, in the 60s we saw God in a grain of sand and heaven in a wildflower. Then it became the glitter and tinsel of someone's ass swaying in a disco ball. And if you're lucky in score, you get to heaven. In the 60s, we went to the moon and back to the land. Now we're running out of land, so who wants to live on the moon here? <laughs> In the 60s, money couldn't buy you love. Now the material girl will entertain any offer. In the 60s, sex was free and natural. Make love, not war. Now it's dangerous and expensive, so you better make money, not love. In the 60s, we had communal living. Now it's codependency, or Airbnb. In the 60s, there was a generation gap. We told it like it is, was, and should be. We were rude to hypocrisy. Then it became the generation gap. People wore the social mask and were rude to each other. Yes, in the 60s, we dropped out of the rat race of the establishment man and joined Bohemia. Now too many rats run Bohemia. In the 60s, the Republicans went apolitically apeshit about a red revolution. Now they drummed up a redneck revolution, and Putin is the love child. In the 60s, hipsters tried to live idealistically in harmony with nature. Now it should be a matter of necessity as we realistically try to save the planet. In the 60s, we tried to change the world. Now we have virtual reality. In the 60s, Tim Leary said, turn on, tune in, and drop out. Now Donald Trump says, turn off, tune out, and drop dead. Hey, yeah. Amen. And if you're not paranoid, you're crazy. Nice. Nice. Peter Kozlowski. Peter Kozlowski. Yeah, I want to do, let's see, you got to get close to the mic here. I want to do a couple quick takes on a couple great songs by great songwriters. Uh, Bob Dylan, the Nobel Prize winner. And another of our favorites, Phil Oakes. You hear the guitar? Oh, where have you been? 
you been, my my blue-eyed son? And where have you been, my darling young one? I've stumbled on the side of twelve misty mountains. I've walked and I've crawled on six crooked highways. I've stepped in the middle of seven sad forests. I've been out in front of a dozen dead oceans. Been ten thousand miles in the mouth of the graveyard. It's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard rain and fall. So what do you do now, my blue-eyed son? What do you do now, my darling young one? I'm going back out for the rain starts to fall I walk to the depths of the deepest black forest Where the people are many, their hands are all empty Where the pellets of poison are flooding their waters Where the home in the valley meets the dark dirty prison And the executioner's face is always well hidden where hunger is ugly, where souls are forgotten And I'll tell it and think it and speak it and breathe it And reflect from the mountain so all souls can see it I'll stand on the ocean until I start sinking I'll know my song well before I start singing It's a hard, it's a hard it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard rain to get us home. It's a hard rain to get us home. Come on and take a walk with me Through that green and growing land Walk through the meadows and the mountains and the sand Walk through the valleys and the rivers and the plains Walk through the sun and walk through the rain Here is a land full of power and glory Beauty that words cannot recall Oh, her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom Her glory shall rest on us all Yes, she's only as rich as the poorest of the poor Only as free as the padlock prison door only as strong as our love for this land Only as tall as we stand Here is a land full of power and glory Beauty that words cannot recall Oh, her power shall rest on the strength of her freedom Her glory shall rest on us all Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Thank you. This is dedicated to Martin Luther King. At home, nobody called you Martin, named after your reverend dad. Then you were just ML. Sweet Auburn, your world, those 12 years you lived in the brown and white Victorian that had been your grandpa's with the surrounding porch, the upstairs balcony, your dormitory, 
those smoldering Atlanta summer nights. Your grandma cooking in the kitchen. In the back, you keeping her company because you like to eat fried chicken, cornbread, and pie a la mode. Your favorites, far from you then, Gandhi's nonviolence as you joined your brother to hammer tacks in the parlor piano, snap the heads of Sister Christine's porcelain dolls, and hide in the basement to escape washing the dishes, playing Monopoly with your bachelor uncle. Sundays, Ebenezer, Daddy King's church, two blocks away, then the dinner where he quizzed you on Bible verses, and the table talk of segregation, Jim Crow, laws in those days of separate but equal, fueling you so that years later you had learned what to pack for the freedom walk, the night in jail, the blue magic shaving powder, hiking boots, travel clock, Sears blue work shirt, jeans, Gandhi's book, the list of things to do, the white t-shirts filling that black leather case, gold initialed MLK that you packed that last time for Memphis found in the Lorraine Motel on Mulberry Street. Today, in Sweet Auburn, shadows swim on the brick of your memorial to the puff, puff of colorless flame, eternal. I cannot see, but feel as I draw near. Next we're going to have David L. Sasser. That year, I was there. Heaven spanned in swirly psychedelics, orange clouds spotting purple sky. That classic poster, 1968, graced my wall an era, an epoch. Year of triumph, year of tragedy. Jumbo jets launched. The Tet Offensive buckled America's knees. 2001, a space odyssey. I went to class. I went to work. I hung out in the park at night. We marched to end war. We studied. We toked. The music bled triumphant. The Who, the Stones, the Grateful Dead. The Beatles. Humans orbited the moon for the first time. Hate struck great men down. Martin Luther King assassinated in Tennessee. We marched for social justice. Robert F. Kennedy assassinated in California. Jefferson Airplane, Cat Stevens, Jimi Hendrix. Every night, the war dead tallied on the news. My hair reached my shoulders. The numbers grew and grew. Times best and worst, I was 20 years old. Numbers became steely clouds, became ashen sky. When those astronauts rounded the moon, Earth rose beneath them. 
No one ever saw that before. It was a great year, an azure sphere mounting the sky. The planets became marbles. Phenomenal bands played triple features at the Fillmore. It was a disastrous year. Marbles struck by marbles shot from the circle. In the park, darkness became moonlight, became shadow on the swings at night. The moon was different somehow now. I could feel America arm wrestling itself. Moon of planting seasons, human tread promised development, threatened contamination. A new aspect, to my eyes, old man moon started to frown. The air heavy with romantic optimism and mortal dread. After Ted, the American public turned more and more against the war. Moon of myth, moon of Jules Verne, space flight turned history on its head. I felt newborn, back and forth in moonlight. And when we talked, we feared and hoped in astronomical terms. All of human history doing a headstand. I felt 100 years old, and we talked about what had been, what might be, what might never be. Here and there were bright spots in and out of purple darkness. Orange glow of car lights coming and going around corners. On a good day, I close my eyes and see that 1968 poster. On a bad night, I see all the marbles not from the circle. Thank you. I was just thinking, what a long, straight trip, long, strange trip this has been. This has been. That is not the title of my piece. But I was thinking, what a long, strange trip this has been. And so many times since the 60s, I thought, no one remembers. No one remembers. Only I. But here we all are, forever young. Kay. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Kay. Thank you, Sarah. You said it. The title of my piece is How I Got My Apartment. Mm -hmm. It was 1966 at the Easter Bee-In in Central Park. I had a yellow flower painted on my face. I was making my way through gone girls in granny skirts and would-be maharishis in tie-dyed vests when I saw him <laughs> carrying a sketch pad and wearing a red and black plaid wool shirt. I didn't know in those days that red and black were always the color you wear on a vision quest. We stopped, smiled at each other, standing about three feet apart, transfixed. He was so beautiful. I thought he might be a barrage or some enchanted mannequin fallen from the clouds. When I blinked, he was gone. Two days later, he was there when I dropped in on friends. That was when I knew there are no accidents. He asked me to go home with him. We walked over the Brooklyn Bridge to this building with a view of the Statue of Liberty from every window. In the morning, he told me he wanted to show me the desert and asked me to come with him to New Mexico. I quit my job. <laughs> 
we, we bought a truck at a Con Edison auction. At night, he held me and told me about the Sangre de Cristo mountains where breathing the air made you high. He, he was my Jesus, my blue eyes, my prayer of pale flesh. He taught me how to roll reefer so I could roll while he was driving. <laughs> you made two little piles of flake inside the folded paper so the flake looks like a couple of mice swallowed by a snake. Then you squash the little mice with your index fingers and thumbs and roll the paper into a tight cylinder. And then you light the match. <laughs> yes. uh, before we left New York, he bought me a low-cut peasant blouse with blue flowers on it. We scored in Pittsburgh, Columbus, Chicago, and St. Louis. We slept in truck stops. In the mornings, he would draw me naked and rosy lying on our piles of clothes out in the parking lot. Truckers would walk by joking high on out on the parking lot. Truckers would walk by joking high on amphetamines and coffee. All the way across Route 66, we looked for convenience stores with only a man on duty. I would select a token loaf of bread, stuff the pockets of my loose denim skirt with cheese, lunch meats, little red boxes of raisins, and go up to the register casually. I would pull my peasant blouse down and smile. <laughs> In Santa Fe, he wanted to leave me, said I was too emotional, talked to strangers about my feelings, wasn't cool. Then he sold a few paintings, decided to stay, made me a pair of sandals and a hashish pipe out of the thigh bone of a chicken. At the peyote rituals, I waited with the Indian women outside the sweat lodge when he stepped out. I handed him an ear of corn. Aww. If you want to know uh, what happened next and how that led to me getting my apartment, in which I've lived for the last 47 years, <laughs> see me after the show. <laughs> <laughs> Better yet, ask for an encore, and we'll come back and hear part two. Okay. <laughs> Davidson and Garrett. I begin with an epigraph by Walt Whitman. Youth, large, lusty, loving. Youth, full of grace, force, fascination. Do you know that old age may come after you with equal grace? force, fascination. Denver, summer of 1969. I thought I knew everything about everything. Little did I grasp. I knew very little about anything. A studious 16-year-old studying at a fancy university for six intensive weeks, floating on my first cloud nine. A free spirit, alone in a rambunctious cow town, dripping with hippies. Tie-dyed tank tops, waist-length hair, festooned the mile-high city, during my glorious summer of psychedelic awakening. Everyone I encountered appeared 18 or younger, strolling the avenues, smoking cheap pot, rebelling, rebelling, rebelling. The Rocky Mountains soaring, a perfect backdrop 
for the amplified celebration of eternal youth. Led Zeppelin blared out of dashboard radios from beat-up rusted vans painted with flowers and peace signs. Protesters angered by Vietnam's carnage tangled narrow streets lustily chanting no more war no more war and yes I was there breathing in all the rage all the wondrous joy all the Whitman-esque promise my birthright in our beloved America I thought I knew everything about everything. However, my coming of age education unfolded quite slowly, like a delicate rose blissfully opening amid the cacophony of a tumultuous decade. Dorothy Freeman will join us next.